Okay. Does everyone get it? So another way the scientists call it confirmation bias. I've got a brother, Kev, uh, and he left school in year eight. And Kev's attitude is, he says, Mick, how can you be positive? So much crap happening. Because all, all big Kev looks for is what's wrong. Is everyone with me? It's called confirmation bias. So if you believe something, you are going to look like hell for things to prove that belief to you. Yeah? That's what your RAS does. And anything that doesn't fulfil that belief, guess what? Your RAS will get rid of it because it's not your focus. So that's a really big one, your RAS. Now, brain networks. I should put my hat back on, but I'm not. You've got two dominant brain networks that operate in your brain. And they are... You're not going to work, are you? First one, analytical. You think about what you do in this place every day. Or down at Springbank or Springfield? Springfield, yep. Think about this stuff. Are these all busy jobs we do? Yeah? Busy jobs. We do it every day. But at the same time, we're doing, doing all those things. Yep? That makes sense. So we've got the analytical and the empathetic. Now it's, I think you can't change this. But if you're aware, you're right. When the empathetic, when you're dealing with that, it suppresses the analytical brain work, brain network. It totally suppresses it, deactivates it. When you're dealing with the analytical, it totally deactivates the empathetic. So they can show this very easily with the imaging. And it, this is only research five, four, five years old. And then it made me think back to when I was teaching. When I was out in the yard teaching phys ed, I was very different teacher than when I was in a classroom teaching maths. Because I was stuck in analytical a lot in a maths class. You with me? Because when I was out with phys ed, I was more in the connecting bit. Now, I'll give you an example. Our brain has to cycle between them. And it's almost impossible. So everyone in this room, in their brain, has a biological neural constraint that won't let you do them together. But if you're aware of it, and you're doing the analytical, doing busy stuff, not to be a hard ass. If you're aware, saying, oh, I know I'm working in this space, I've got to remember the human cost. Is everyone with me? Because it's very easy to lose a human cost. Charlie Scudamore, he's deputy at Geelong Grammar, he tells this story about and Charlie's a wonderful de deputy principal. He's a fantastic guy, Scudders. He tells this story about he was racing to a meeting he was late for and this kid in about year nine came up and said, Scudders, they don't call him Mr Scudder more, they call him Scudders. Scudders, Scudders, I've got to talk to you. I've got to talk to you. He said, look, look, see, can you see me in an hour? And he kept going. Totally ruined that relationship with that kid for ever. Because when someone comes to you, is their problem the most important issue in the world? And what do Scudders do? Didn't treat it as the most important issue in the world. And he said his relationship with that child was never the, never the same. So, ooh, cycling is very hard, but self-awareness will get us over it. So I need four volunteers. We're going to do an experiment. Come on, four, please. Two males, two females. If not, I'll just nominate you. <laughs> That's how it works. I'm not very democratic. Come on, someone different. Okay, all right, here we go. Oh, Pete's on the way. And Bron, here we go. Okay. Do you guys know each other? Yep. Yeah? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll introduce yourself. All right. So, 
they're going to cycle between empathetic and analytic. So this is how we go. Pete, you're in the middle. You're on this side, Wendy. Mm -hmm. You're on that side, Russ. Bron, you're here. You are going to read empathetic questions to <coughs> Pete. You've got to answer them. Move out a bit, Pete, because you're going to trip over something. You've got to do something else I haven't told you about yet. Catch <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can do that if you want. And you, Wendy, are going to read analytical questions. Right. So the brain's going to have to go analytical, empathetic, analytical, empathetic. Is everyone with me? What you're doing, Bron, is that you're doing here and you're doing... <laughs> and Pete, you have to copy Bron. <laughs> while answering the questions. Oh, oh, now, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, I know, so now you just do six. So, do you, do six no, 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 no. You, you ask one. Yeah, Wendy asks. And soon as Pete answers it, you ask Wendy. Soon as Pete answers it, you ask Pete. Russ. You know what I mean? Listen, yeah. Pete. So, I'm asking Bron. No, no, no. no you're asking Pete. Russ, Pete. Russ asks Pete. Yep. As soon as he answers, you shoot one. Yep. As soon as he answers, you shoot one. As soon as he answers. And meanwhile, Pete <laughs> is doing all this stuff. <laughs> Pete, watch out behind you. Yeah. Okay. Here we go, let's do it. Okay, good to go, Pete. What's your partner's birthday? Oh, Pete, you're going to have to do that. Your partner's birthday is half of March 8th. What? Half of 28th. What? Half of 28th. Oh, what is your mum's maiden name? Uh, Angus. Oh, no, no, we can't. Nine times eight minus three. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, all right. White flag. Rotate, rotate then. Oh. Russ, you're in the middle. Oh, right. Wendy, you're at the front. <laughs> yeah. No, you're over there. Yep. God. You're all right, Pete? I'm good. So I have to make up the actions, do I? Yeah. I follow the actions. Watch out behind you because you can trip on that whiteboard. We don't need you to do that. <laughs> now, Wendy, rev him up a bit, eh? All right, here we go. Here we go. So, uh, what's your partner's birthday? Oh, hang on, let me go. Sorry. The next six, the next six. What are my two friends' names? Uh, Peter and Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Three times seven, take two. Three times seven, 21, take 39. <laughs> what is your current achievement? Uh, I was counting up here today. How many is three and a half dozen? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 42. <laughs> Makes you happy. Uh, doing this. <laughs> <laughs> how many hours in 30 minutes? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing out in 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, 300 minutes. In 300? How many hours in 300? Uh, five. Uh, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> no, fast food. <laughs> <laughs> what is an emotion, uh, what's an emotion you don't enjoy feeling? He's on the for you, Robbo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, woo. <laughs> Give him a hand. Now, what time is it? It's 10 to. Get in fours. Here's a. Ah, yeah, you're going to do it. And up, no. You can go outside, you can go there. Just be back here, back here at 2 o'clock. And so you read six questions, doing it. And then you rotate your possession and then do another six. Everyone got it? Yep. Yep. Okay, so in fours, well done. <laughs> okay, here we go. I was just talking to Matt and the guys, and Henry and Tom and that. I've seen this done in, in subjects where people can talk about the factual, one of the questions is talking about the factual side of the subjects, the like French Revolution, you know. What year was it in? How many people were killed? Blah, blah, blah. And the other one is saying, what was the social impact on people in the streets? And what, and they were cycling from analytical to empathetic in a subject area. Whose head turned to mush? Yeah. So just think, just what happens in a classroom? Are we expecting kids and ourselves to cycle and Ben, no, no, sorry. James made the comment, you know, 
sometimes in a classroom, our analytical, where we are analytically and where kids are empathetically, there's a mild gap, isn't there? So those five minute mind and heart calmers get us all back to an empathetic level, the same? Yep. And if there's a gap, it's never gonna work. So you get a bit of an idea how your brain works now by actually stuffing up. It's darn hard, isn't it? So that's a great activity to do with kids, but you can do it at a subject level if you can think up the questions for each side. Um, any comments about that activity? Anything you learned or anything? I know it nearly killed Pete, but uh, <laughs> you've recovered, mate. <coughs> Bronnie's in trouble. Okay, could be a lawsuit here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, I just want to go on. Now, this has been what we've just looked at and looked at and looked at for the last decade. The non-cognitive... I'm standing in the wrong place. The non-cognitive stuff has been largely ignored. But the research is compelling. Non-cognitive has the biggest bearing on academic and social growth by far. So if we do that stuff, it makes a hell of a difference. Yeah? Non-cognitive. Now here are the mind and heart karmas. Just read that for a minute, please. Can you read it? Can anyone see it? Don't squint, Alicia. Are we nearly done? The first two minutes is the most important. Are the most important. So here's an example of some. In the front of the book, Shane's got over here. You got a teacher user manual? And I'll probably have to email them to you, Stu. I've written a hundred of them. The moment the kids, for the two minutes, have to pick up a pen and write it. You've got to get them to do solitude. Okay? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, just great and awesome assignments to get kids down to at high school. So the kids that aren't confident writing. Well, they're going to have to think or draw it. You know, the less cognitive kids are, any age group can draw. So get them to draw what they feel. That's what you're talking about before, Shane, wasn't it? Yeah. So Shane and his wife Angie talk about trying these things here, these journals. We've got one for P2 I'll put together. We'll do one for early childhood. We'll write it on the way up today in the car, right? How about... No, I'm serious. <laughs> Beer and writing. You haven't organised a driver. <laughs> oh, you idiot. <laughs> no, seriously. Here, how about with the person next to you, pick up, and just this one, we'll just do a discussion. Just pick one with the person next to you. Let's talk about it for two minutes. Let's go. Let's do it. You know those wellbeing fitness challenges? Can you turn to them? I think they're on page three, please. I didn't get to talk about them much, did I? Now, tell me if often I forget about what I've talked about. So, <laughs> tell me if I have. This is wonderful. So, in your staff rooms, put up a what went well board. Okay, if you've got several staff rooms, but you guys aren't big enough to have, you know, you come in the main social stuff. Have one of them, a WW board, and on it, write down anything that's funny or you've had fun doing that you can share on the board, yeah? A few of you will have to be out of the blocks and be the positive primers to get it going. Because once people see a bit of stuff there, they'll start writing it. No one wants to be the first person, do they? Okay, so the wellbeing fitness challenges every week, okay, Someone other than your leadership group, someone in here say, hey, put up on the board, our wellbeing fitness challenge this week is da 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 da. Okay? And we're going to try and have fun to build self reg and self awareness doing it. 
and journal it, write it down. But if you see something, if you do something, write it up on the board. The Wellbeing Fitness Challenges are great fun. In the kids' books, in the kids' books, there are kids' wellbeing fitness challenges. You can do it as a class, you can do it as a year level, but it's really just gets those, you know, those positives we talked about today. Get them up and running. Okay, we write with them how these work, these mind and heart karmas. Did anyone notice anything wrong with the numbering there? There's no nine. Shane just suggested I say uh, question 10 is where is number nine? <laughs> so, okay. So we're going to do another activity shortly, which is a ripper. Right when you go into staff rooms and people have their character strength wheels up above their desk. It's great if you go into principal's offices and leadership offices and they have the cohorts of kids' character strengths up on the board instead of the other stuff. Let's make sure we measure things we value. I'll say that again, make sure we measure things we value. And when that happens, South Korea has proved it. They took their focus, a ridiculous focus, and moved it halfway. In Singapore, earlier this year, no, not earlier this year, last year, in taxis, every taxi hopped into, the Singaporean drivers were saying, we're worried about our kids. They've got no social skills. They can't conduct conversations. They get great grades, but they're just robots. Have anyone, any of you ever seen kids like that? Yeah? So we don't want more brainiacs. Who's heard of Howard Gardner? What did Howard Gardner do? Yep. So Howard, he's a eccentric. He created multiple intelligences, saying that we're a combination of seven or eight intelligences. Anyway, he put out a book and he only ever was interested in the creative, critical and synthesising minds. He said three minds, that's all we need. Well, ha he started to look at what was happening in the world. He's starting to say, hold on, society's starting to fall to bits. And in 2009, he bought out a book called Five Minds. Go on the, go on the net and get a synopsis of it. Don't read the book to give you a synopsis about to what the five minds are. And he added two more minds that he said were more important than creative, critical, synthesising. Those two minds, the respectful mind and the ethical mind. He could see a world that didn't have ethics and didn't have respect. Now, I'd love to live in a world where everyone was ethical and that. And this is sometimes I start keynotes like this. So I'm going to give you his quote. I love it. From Howard Gardner, who was only interested in intelligence. This is Howard. This is how far he's come. He's gone, at the end of the day, the world doesn't need any more of the brightest and the best, but more of those of good character. Agree? So let's build, if we build kids and we role model it, the character is super important. Forget about the academics. It's going to, be, going to come in rushes. The kids are going to fly academically if we get them socially, emotionally right. So, are we measuring the right things? Have a talk to each other for a minute or so. Okay. What did this guy do? Who's ever heard of Copernicus? What did he do, mate? Yeah. Up until 1453, he released a body, you know, celestial fears, and he put in it that forever the world thought the earth was in the middle and everyone went round us. And he said, no, that's not true. The sun is in the middle and we all go round. 
So the earth orbits the sun. That was a pretty gutsy move. What do you think? Just telling people everything they'd written and researched was rubbish. Well, there's another two things, happiness and success. And psychologists and people in pre-2000 thought you had to be successful to be happy. happy. Well, the likes of Sean Accor, Dinah Lumaboski, I can't even say a name, have found that instead of happiness orbiting success, guess what's in the middle? Happiness. And then success comes from happiness. So some, one meta-analysis, 275,000 people. And that was in all of the states, 275,000. They did social-emotional learning. They had classes of social-emotional learning. The rest of the states didn't do social-emotional learning. What do you think happened with those two? Well, it's an obvious thing. The 275, I can tell you the research if you want to read it, 275,000 had an average 11 point grade increase in every subject. Minimum 11 point grade increase. Less absence, less inappropriate behaviour, participated in more extracurricular sport. They were just thriving human beings. Is there a message in that? It's not 50 people, it's 275,000. Ed Diner was the main man behind it. So, where do you derive most happiness? Jeremy, where does your happiness come from mainly? Family? Relationships? Anyone else? Anyone agree with that? Relationships. Another guy, George Valiant, he studied 75 years it went for before the last one died. And George is paid, he's buried, he's not well. But um, when these students started at university and he interviewed them every single year of what were the highlights that made their life tick. Every single year till the last one died in, in after 75 years. And guess what they said was number one? Healthy relationships. Like my good friend Con says, only three variables in a school. Relationships, relationships and relationships. All right, we're going to do this activity. I would suggest you use this with kids. You know when kids ca catastrophize? Yeah? I wouldn't use it with little ones so much. This is stuff. If, can you go to the self reg? I don't know what page it's on. 21. <clears throat> so when something happens it's the worst thing in the world the adolescent brain with puberty is a turbulent place so get them to write them in order of importance uh huh and get you know you've got to do it when the sun's shining when you know they're not it's it's not stormy. And then when they have their inevitable problem, yeah, you say, where does it fit in on that scale? Where does it slide in? Is it above that or below that in importance to you? And it's a very good strategy because of, so they come into your office and they're so upset that it's really something that comes in down here. Is everyone getting what I'm saying? So any time we can visualise things for kids, it's a lot better. So that's a good one to use. And you heard about Pro Rider and the Elephant. How does he make that big thing go, move? What's he do to it? How does a rider get the elephant to do what he wants? The rider is the prefrontal cortex, yeah? The elephant's... What we do, we distract it. Oh, hell, I've got to go to the website. Sorry, I'm going to have to go quick because I want to show you the website. I forgot about that. All right, self-awareness, all right. 
Okay. This is the best activity, and then we go to the website. Three joys. It's on under empathy. What page empathy on, everyone? Sorry? 16. 16. Quickly, we've got to get do this quick. Okay. Can you write down? This will, and it doesn't have to be these topics. Three joys. Something that's just happened, you're prepared to share. One thing you want to achieve. Something that you are proud of about yourself. That's hard to do, but please do it. Okay, let's write down those, because you've got to be able to talk for two and a half minutes on these things. Teachers are transmitters, they are not receivers. So what will happen halfway through, people start wanting to have conversation. Yep. Resist it. It is a monologue. You are listening. Empathy is not about, is not about thinking about what you're going to say back. It is taking it in. Yes? Understanding and accepting. So don't interrupt. Two and a half minutes. The next two and a half minutes... The other two people ask questions to learn more. A bit like tell me more, yeah? And the last minute, the two of you who were listening have to try and pick what two or three of the person's top strengths are from the way they told the story. Got it? On your rolls, leave a bit of room that long after the kid's name to write in three or four of their strengths. Okay, next to every kid's name. What, what do you do, Shane? Very creative with the kids' strengths? Yeah, on their desk. Top five on their desk. Top five on their desk. OK, wouldn't work in a secondary school. So change rooms. But definitely primary. OK, in threes, I'm going to do the time. Let's do it. It's a great activity, this. <laughs>